And uh, again, thank you so, so much, everyone. So uh, for those who are just joining us again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm sincerely, sincerely honored to meet such a, an amazing and, and diverse and global audience today. Uh, I, I already look forward to listening to our esteemed speakers uh, who will be sharing a wide, um, a wide range, really, of powerful topics uh, with, with today's audience. So as I often mention in our monthly GSP convenes, um, I'm truly excited to hear more about what is driving us to make a change, uh, to, to share ideas about how we can collaborate, and, um, and most importantly, for us to make a change together. So it goes back to one of the key ingredients of our global sustainability partnership converse conversations, which I mentioned earlier, which are not-nots. So for those who are unfamiliar with the term, the not-nots are what are keeping us awake at night. So it's the not-nots who are those ideas, you know, those passions or those innovations that inspire us, um, that we can just not not be involved with. So um, this is, is really the synergy between not only the speakers today, but also all of our audience present, which results in knowing we can make a change for a more sustainable future together. So to briefly introduce myself, so my name is Louis uh, Majwa. I'm the president of the Global Sustainability Partnerships, uh, which is a global legacy program and a safe platform for change makers, organizations and businesses that are aligned with UN sustainability development goals uh, to connect with each other. So the purpose of our monthly convenes and the yearly summit is to basically enable uh, global alliances and maintain the global connections that support each other, <clears throat> each other projects and sustainable businesses for measurable impact and action in our communities. So without further ado, being conscious of time, please let me introduce to you our moderator for today, the wonderful Tina Greenbaum. Tina is a seasoned executive coach who has been helping executives for over 37 to 39 years now. Um, she's also worked in Washington, uh, Washington DC, New York City, San Francisco, helping leaders improve their leadership skills. She took her success training Olympic level athletes, actors, dancers, performers, and applied that knowledge for her clients in business and government. Today, she's a trusted advisor to work with leaders who have the potential to impact the world in a positive way. Thanks so much, Tina, for joining us today. And please feel free to take over. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Loretta, for putting together this amazing conference. I'm just watching the numbers of the people that are coming on um, every minute. And just, again, what we're saying is how much interest there is and how much help we all need and how much, how much we can offer. So I want to welcome everybody here. We're delighted to have you. Our very first speaker, and I want to make sure that I can pronounce this correctly, Idiolil Pashalari is of Albanian nationality and holds a master's in business administration, a master's of arts and political science, a master's in entrepreneurology, and a bachelor's degree in LLB, which I'm not sure exactly what that is, but maybe she'll tell us. She is presently the secretary general of the World Assembly of Youth, which is called WAY as a, as an, as a little one, acronym. She is headquartered in Malacca, Malaysia, She's responsible for the administration and the running of secretariat and headquarters. She initiate, initiates and coordinates regional and international youth related activities and also consults on strategies and policies for youth at different levels. She also coordinates humanitarian and relief programs around the world and delivers educational and advocacy papers, speeches and presentations of youth on youth and related issues. She's the main representative of WAY at the United Nations, intergovernmental platforms, non-governmental organizations, 
and ministries responsible for youth. Wow. And she's going to speak to us on the importance of youth participation and their impact towards sustainable development. Please welcome Idiola. Here we go. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, for the introduction. Uh, distinguished speakers, organizers, participants, volunteers, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Allow me to first thank the organizers for inviting me to be with you and share my two cents with all of you, especially on these vital and challenging times that we are all living on. But most importantly, I'm very pleased because I'm going to speak about a topic that is very, very close to my heart, young people. And of course, their importance and their participation to an impact towards sustainable development. The topic already says it all. I believe it. I'm up for it. And it says a lot. Young people are important. You know what? Let me rephrase it. Like Loretta was saying earlier on, women are important. I'll rephrase it. Young people are very, very important. And you know why? Because their participation and impact is very crucial to achieve sustainable development at local, regional, and global level. But before I tell you how important young people are and why they are important, allow me to introduce the World Assembly of Youth or else known as WE. It was found back in 1949 to bring young people from different society, communities, countries together to share ideas, thoughts, and of course, action on how to improve cooperation at global level and among the young people themselves. So for 73 years now, we have been working tirelessly to make young people voices heard and provide such a platform. We are a coordinating body of national youth councils, which tackle 21 youth issues, and we have membership in 140 member countries, mostly national youth councils and or national youth organizations. And we work on the promotion of young people and youth program in areas such as education, employment, environment, human rights, democracy, population, health, drugs, peace, gender equality. Like I say, 21 of them, community development and leadership training. So there is a lot to discuss because everything end of the day is interrelated. Through my capacity as a Secretary General of WAY, I have initiated and supported various youth program and activities organized by us or in collaboration with United Nations, governments and other institutions. In partnership with all the stakeholders, we have organized and co-organized various events on youth related issues and also contribute in drafting and creation of national youth councils, national youth policies, strategies, and anything related for young people. Personally, working with young people has been a dream come true. You are always learning something new every single day. They are the innovators. <laughs> they are the idea provider. They are the action-based at every level. Honestly, we need to acknowledge the fact that young people are the experts of their lives. Unfortunately, in many countries, that's not the case. In some case, I'm sorry, countries, they are used for political gain or other agendas that I will not go into details about, but we need to acknowledge them that if you want to tackle youth issues, you need to bring them at the table. So what we do at WAY, we provide a platform for people so that every event that is organized is by the youth, for the youth, so they can not only speak out their mind, but act upon it. And we believe that engaging young people in all processes like planning, implementing, Monitoring and evaluating of every policy that affects their life is very crucial. They should be the partners in every step of the decision-making process because it's not only their benefit, 
but at the same time, is there a cause? We are talking about them, we should give them the flow. Young people represent 50% of the world's population, and they have the potential to make the most effective transformation of the world into a better place for all. They are those key change. But in order for us to understand better, let me just give you a, a small idea or just a glimpse of what young people are. They are critical thinkers. They have the capacity to identify and challenge existing power structures and barriers to change and expose contradiction and biases. Young people are change makers. They have the power to act and mobilize others. They're also innovators. I mean, look at everything that has been evolving in technology nowadays. It all has come from young people. And they do best understand the problems they face and can offer new ideas and alternative solutions. Plus, they are communicators. Young people can be partners in communicating the development agenda to their peers, to their communities, society at local, regional, or international level for that matter. And they are the generation who have brought change in many countries throughout history. They are also leaders. Young people can drive change in their communities and countries. So I believe in empowering young people, but I also believe they should lead us. They have the skills and the ambition to bring change that we can embrace. Their participation and impact is very important for us to achieve sustainable development. So like I mentioned all those wonderful qualities, they have taught me in my 16 years of experience of working with Way that young people have the solution. They just need that platform. So are they important for participation? Definitely, yes. We're talking about 50% of the population. Can they bring impact? They have done it for many centuries. Can they talk about sustainable development? They were the one who introduced way before other generation, no offenses. So let's sit down and act. I'll end here and wait for the questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if everybody could pick up the energy <laughs> that Idila feels about youth. I certainly can, and uh, I'm sure you're an amazing leader for them. And I'm also sitting here and thinking, as I've been for the last two and a half years, pretty alone in this office. And the idea of connecting, and not only on Zoom, but we're able to get out a little bit. And I want you to listen really carefully, like, what can I get involved with? You know, what is my not not? What is it, you know, from the leaders that are speaking today, please think about connecting with them, volunteering, offering your services. So I want you to think about that as we kind of go through this um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful morning. So thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your excitement and love of youth, and I'm with you. <laughs> so, okay, so our next guest is Hesham. Hesham, oh, Elsiad Isa. Hesham, yes. did I pronounce you correctly? Hopefully. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you graduated from Ain Shams University in 1985 and his master's degree from Cairo University in economics and also has two post diploma political and economic systems. Um, African research and studies in, from the institution of Cairo and I, there's so much here that you are obviously very well educated and we are delighted. Thank you. Thank I can you. read all of these wonderful things, but you are the head of the Central Department of Climate Change and the Egyptian Environmental Affairs Agency. This is very important. And head of international cooperation in the Ministry of Environment and the Egyptian focal point of United Nations Convention Framework of Climate Change. So we have a real expert here, which is awesome. 
and you have uh, represented Africa in host in the host country committee for CDM in the World Bank. I don't know what CDM is, but I do know what the World Bank is. And um, you're a, a member in the Egyptian steering committee of the Green Climate Fund and Global Environmental Facility. And you're also the author of the book, The Future of History. Please welcome, with the talk that he's gonna give with us, The Impact of Climate Change Agreements in Human Rights. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being thank, here. Thank you very much for uh, this introduction. And uh, before I would present uh, my presentation, I want to clar clarify about what is a CDM. CDM is uh, uh, abbreviation of Clean Development and Mechanism, which is related to the uh, uh, climate change project uh, targeting to reducing the greenhouse gas emission. So its name Thank is you. Greenhouse. So, so uh, uh, my presentation today, if you allow me to share my screen, uh, is uh, uh, the human right according to the climate change convention and the human rights. All of uh, uh, first, all of us see uh, my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, all of us talking about the climate change phenomena and what is the impact of the climate change, of course. But uh, in uh, this is in my point of view, uh, all of the scientific uh, people in all over the world accepted or agree what about climate change affected on the, the, the life uh, on the earth. But in my point of view, when this uh, uh, agreement uh, uh, convert from the scientific room into the political room, there is some, uh, we can say, some conflict of interest between all uh, participants in the uh, conventions of climate change. So what is uh, my presentation today is what is the climate change uh, convention and human rights? How is the climate change convention affected the human rights? Uh, so uh, the first uh, uh, is a content list, which, which is the concept of climate change and its impact and affected the impact of the uh, climate justice and the climate change and the human rights and uh, my recommendation. Uh, first of all, that uh, what is the climate change? Climate change is increasing the carbon dioxide emission. And we saw on the uh, right of uh, this uh, slide, uh, uh, what is uh, the climate change phenomena? It's greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, make some barriers for uh, the sun uh, issue. So it's make and heat waves and affected the weather system uh, over the period of time starting from the industrial uh, revolution in the 18th century. And uh, what is the source of the greenhouse gas? This is an in two <laughs> slides uh, to introduce what is uh, uh, the climate change content? What is the greenhouse gas? What is the mean of the greenhouse gas? If, ever, uh, if anyone, if anyone did not know what is uh, the uh, uh, greenhouse gases content, uh, the greenhouse gases is a CO2 and CH4 uh, and nitric acid. And uh, you see in the picture uh, from sources, what is the sources of uh, these greenhouse gases? affected all over the world. So, in this regard, what is the climate change uh, affected, affected uh, issue of the style life in all over the world? The biodiversity, the health, the food security, the water resources, and of course, the uh, uh, coastal zone uh, uh, in all over the world, which is related to uh, beaches area. And here we can see this uh, uh, contain two main uh, map. The first one, which is what is the country affected the climate change? We see in the, in, the, in the left map, this is the developed country, which is emitted 90% from greenhouse gases, uh, the north of the, the earth. But the countries affected by climate change, we see on the right uh, of the uh, of the right of the uh, map, is the developing country. So we can say here there is no uh, uh, climate justice. 
and the climate justice is the term is used to forming the global warming and the ethical and the political issue rather than one that uh, in the environment in uh, in the nature so that mean and if you see uh, in this annual carbon dioxide uh, emission we will see that africa produce about 1.1 metric ton of climate warming uh, carbon dioxide emission per person in in 2019 it below the uh, average is 4.7. Thus, the US produced 16 metric tons per person. So here, what we can say, what here is, is that a climate just between all the country, countries, some countries, a con continent of Africa uh, uh, emitted 1.1 and uh, US per, uh, emitted 16.1. So there is no climate justice here. And in this regard, without climate justice, so the climate change is affected the human rights. And here, uh, Miss Mary Winford, which is uh, the, the uh, Irish, uh, uh, ex-Irish president, say uh, a, a statement which is a climate change is the greatest threat to the human rights in the two uh, in the in the 21st century so how can the, the 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 people or the country or the convention dealing with the effect of climate change in the human rights we see that a lot of declaration which issued by the uh, uh, human rights council and also uh, um, uh, uh, issued by some sort of uh, paris agreement and uh, uh, UNFCCC, uh, United Nations Convention of Climate Change, uh, starting from March 2008. I will not uh, uh, lose the time to to read uh, the summary of the declaration, but I will, uh, of course, send this presentation to everyone uh, or to uh, Louis uh, if if someone needs this presentation. But uh, what I am mean here that. In spite of uh, uh, some of the declaration uh, related to the effect of the climate change on the human rights issuance by the uh, Human Rights Council and also by the United Nations Convention of Climate Change, as we see starting from 2008 and 2009, 2010. But here, the human rights, as we see here, the human rights must be proven in the ongoing negotiation that we are uh, we want to put it in the next COP, and the new agreement must be familiar in the human rights framework because of what we will see here every declaration talking about the human rights all declaration and recommendation talking about the need for states to address climate change without specifying the direct responsibility of the developed country. That means all statement or all declaration which issued by the Human Rights Council or the uh, United Nations uh, Framework Convention of Climate Change or also Paris Agreement talking about the states but did not differentiate it between the development states and the developed state, which is the first, uh, according to historical responsibility, related to why we are talking about human rights. Human rights here, which are talking about why did not developed country did not make their effort to uh, uh, help the uh, uh, developing country to solve the problem of the climate change. Although all the legal provision of climate change agreement are clear on support the, for developing country in Article 9 and Article 6 in Paris Agreement, but this support is still very limited in a few of the worsening negative impact of climate change. Yes, we have Article 9 uh, talking about the financial support, Article 10 talking about the technology and uh, capacity building support, but still this is in the convention or the in the agreement, but it still did not uh, facing the ambition for uh, the human rights uh, affected by the climate change. So here, what is the analysis? 
although the preamble of the Paris Agreement referred to the impact of climate change on the human rights, uh, the clear uh, rules of the dealing with the matter of, is still vague and no optional framework have been put in place to deal uh, positively with the impact of climate change. So what is the result here? We will see the weakness support facing on climate change increasing uh, in the number of illegal migration. This is one of the effect of uh, climate change and also affected on the human rights increasing the economic deficit in the developing country. This is also affected the climate change and affected the human rights. And this is because of the climate change convention, not, not only the climate change itself as a phenomenon. Increasing the cost of the health and social care and the ending poverty is still part of, or still weaknesses uh, uh, related to the weakness of supporting facing on climate change. So, because of that, what we can say here, we can say that the negotiator are still negotiating while the world is drawing. So this is the result. Until now, there is no concrete impact on uh, the negotiation starting from Paris Agreement until uh, Glasgow. There is no concrete result talking about how we can solve the problem of the developing country in climate change. What is the recommendation in the next COP in, uh, in, 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 in Egypt? I recommend that it's time to change the climate change. And thank you for your hearing my presentation. Thank you. Ah. Okay. See if we can. Wow. Well, you certainly opened up my eyes. I never really put the two together in such concrete way. And um, kind of as you were talking, I was thinking about the question of, am I my brother's keeper? It's a question that um, in many, many ways of all the things that we're talking about today. So thank you. And, and I'm sure the conversation people would love to continue with is what do we do? How can we best um, support the work that you're doing and the whole concept of human yes. rights. Uh, and excuse me, if you allow me, I left my uh, my email uh, in the chat room. If anyone wants to contact me in, in this regard, yes. on regard on climate change, uh, I would be a uh, pleasure in that. Yes, Thank because you. this little 10 minute, you know, we have little 10 minute snips of getting uh, just a taste of all the amazing things that you people are doing. And again, how we can help and support and improve the world, not just the country, but the world. Um, yes. Lewis, is Pooja here? I don't know. Um, I know she was not able to come earlier. Yes, and so Pooja will, will join us in about 10 minutes uh, if she okay. still can. So we can, we can proceed with uh, Sophie okay. Medley. Okay. Yes. Okay, so our next guest and speaker is Sophie Medlin. She is a well-recognized consultant dietitian, director, director of City Dietitians, and is the chair of the British Dietetic Association for London. Sophie has expertise in gastrointestinal and collect colorectal health. She worked in acute hospitals specializing in gastrointestinal diseases before moving into academia, where she worked as a lecturer at King's College in London. Sophie is a go-to spokesperson for media when it comes to evidence-based nutrition, regularly featuring in print, broadcast, and social media. And she's gonna to talk to us today about redefining the focus of nutrition from aesthetics to health. And I'm really interested to see where she's going with this. So please <laughs> welcome Sophie. Thank you so much, Tina. And as everyone has said, it's so lovely to be here and have so many people online and interested in what we're talking about today. I might take a massive liberty and fill up a bit of extra time because I could talk about this stuff all day. Um, I am currently in my clinic in central London um, with my lovely dog under my desk. So if he starts ferreting around and you can hear some funny noises, it's him, not me. Um, one of the things that I always find it important and useful to do, uh, particularly when we have this many people in the room, is give people 
a bit of understanding about the difference between different people in the nutrition space. So dietitians, we're the medical nutrition people. So dietitians will do a four year degree normally here in the UK. Uh, foundations of nutrition, so we'll do almost two or three years just to understand the science of nutrition. Uh, and then we go on to learn how to apply that to medicine. So if anyone has a medical condition that they want nutrition help for, you need a dietitian. Nutritionists are generally people who are trained to work with the general public, people who are healthy, um, that kind of thing, work in public health. And I work with some incredible nutritionists in research when I worked at King's and other universities, but they're not trained to work with people who are unwell. They're not medically trained. And then here in the UK, we also have um, people who are called nutritional therapists, which are more like alternative medicine people. So not necessarily uh, evidence based individuals. Um, and that's not their fault. It's just the way that they're trained. And it's a very different profession to what I do. And as Tina really kindly said, I've been a registered dietitian since 2007. I worked my way up through the NHS. Um, I was a lecturer for about five years. And now I direct my company, City Dietitians where we see lots of patients, we see lots of patients today, mostly with complex colorectal conditions, so problems with their bowel or rectum. Um, and then I also do product development work. So I design vitamins and probiotics and other products. And I also do a lot of media work, which keeps me busy all in all. Um, but I'm very lucky to love everything that I do. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to come and talk to you today about what is going on in the world of nutrition and how we can perhaps all work together to try and make things a little bit better for the future generations. So one of the things that worries me significantly is that 67 to 92% of teenagers report using social media for health information. And the, the range goes between these three things. So we know from fitness, sexual health and nutrition. And as some of my colleagues may talk to you later, there's been some incredible steps towards health from social media. We've seen some really positive stuff happen, including people being much more interested in kale than they ever have been and eating more avocados than we can produce as a country, as a world, as a, as a planet. Um, but unfortunately, there are some downsides to this because perhaps not everything that they're reading is correct. So lots and lots of teenagers are using social media as almost a public health platform. They're using it to get this health information from. Unfortunately, as many of us adults will be in different areas that we're not experts in, many teenagers are unable to identify reliable health information. So what they can't do, as many of us can't, is tell the difference between fact and fiction on these social media platforms, despite going to them for advice. And most people, most teenagers will use social media above any other platform. So they're not going to the NHS here in the UK, so the public health boards and things like that. They're very much going to social media to get their questions answered about nutrition, sexual health, fitness, and all of these places, which leads us on to whether that is a reliable place to get information from. It's really important to remember that nutrition is really complex. It's a really complex field. Every organ of your body is affected by everything that you eat. And I don't say that to frighten people because actually the human body is incredible at making sure you get what you need from your diet. Even if your diet is quite limited, you generally gravitate towards foods that are generally reasonably balanced. So actually nutrition is really complex. And so it's very easy for people to fall into traps of thinking that they know everything particularly here in the UK, but I'm sure in other countries too, we have really poor nutrition education in schools, a really high public interest in nutrition, and that has really made social media this breeding ground for false information about nutrition. And what that looks like now to young people and perhaps to the rest of us as well, is this idea that if somebody has an idealized body, and I'll talk a bit more about that later, if someone has an idealized body shape, so they're very slim, or very curvy for women now, but for curvy in very particular ways, or for men, if you have a six pack and lots of bulging muscles and very low body fat percentage, that means that you're someone that people should take nutrition advice from. You're someone that should be, it's an expert in nutrition and people should be listening to. But of course that's not the case. And I will talk a bit more about that later. So what we know about social media is that it's a breeding ground for these dietary trends. So some things that you may have heard of are clean eating, plant-based diets, detox diets, dairy-free diets, coconut oil, keto diets, the list goes on and on and on. And if you are in any way connected with social media, I'm sure that you've heard about lots of these things. Now, one of these stands out for me as being really important to point out as being different. Of course, plant-based diets are something that we should be uh, supporting in many ways, um, including making sure that people are eating in an environmentally conscious way. 
what we find from the influencer community is people really encouraging people to go completely vegan without giving any advice on how to protect yourself from nutritional deficiencies, which groups of people perhaps aren't suited to a completely vegan diet due to other medical or nutrition issues. Um, so we have lots of people pushing these ways of eating or detox starts, which aren't a thing. Clean eating is not a thing. No one's invented that. That was just invented by influencers. There's a real encouragement of cutting out dairy among the influencer community, which has its own health risks. We've got what the Osteoporosis Society in the UK call a ticking time bomb for teenage bone health, with everyone cutting out dairy from their diet and moving to plant-based milks without any dietitian or nutritional person telling people to do that. Just a real push from influencers that people should be doing this. And of course, we had some documentaries that really frightened people. And now there's this real kickback against dairy, which is undoubtedly going to lead to a disaster for, for teenage bone health uh, as, those, as those young people get older. We've seen coconut oil take over the world when we fought so hard to get people's saturated fat intake down. Coconut oil is full of saturated fat, which we still know is super harmful to our long-term cardiac health. And of course, keto diets are one that you may or may not have heard of, and apologies if you're not interested in any of this stuff, but I talk about it all day and assume that everyone's interested. Um, ketogenic diets are a very low carbohydrate diet, and absolutely, you know, if you tap into any sort of low carb communities online, it's a real militant community these days. And ketogenic diets are something that no dietitian has ever recommended, apart from to a very small cohort of children with epilepsy, which is what they were invented for. So just to sort of give you a flavor of some of the things that we're constantly trying to battle in this world. And every week I get called up by a journalist who says, can you comment on this weird and wonderful new diet that Jennifer Aniston's following or so-and-so is following? I just, they're inventing everything different every day. It's so hard to keep on top of it, but there are always these loud, loud voices in nutrition online telling people that this is what they should be doing. It's gonna change their life. It's gonna solve all their problems. And actually, no one from a public health level has ever recommended any of this stuff. It's purely social media trends driving this forward. So in terms of accuracy, and if we were in a room, it'd be lovely to see a show of hands, but how many people are at how much research, how much nutrition information online is or on social media is accu actually accurate? Well, we know from the UK study that research from the University of Glasgow shows 90% of UK social media influencers weight management advice and general nutrition advice is incorrect. So when we pair that with how many teenagers are going to the internet for advice on weight management, on nutrition in general, we can see how likely it is that they are going to stumble across bad advice, dangerous advice, and how unlikely it is that they're going to come across evidence-based and safe advice. I just wonder, like, which again, I could ask you, is it a surprise? Is that something that you consider to be surprising or is it just something that you think, yeah, I can imagine that's that's quite right. Ask yourselves and perhaps think about the own, your own algorithm that you're consuming. One of the things we've seen, unfortunately, a massive rise of is body image problems post pandemic. It was huge before the pandemic, but it's really uh, been much stronger post pandemic. And what we know is that 20% of adults and 40% of teenagers say that images on social media cause them to worry about their body. Poor body image is caused by exposure to idealized and unrealistic bodies, not just through social media. Previously, it was always through magazines and things like that. Now it's much more focused on social media and it's much more in your face than it ever used to be. And of course, many of these images are edited, airbrushed. The influencers aren't um, declaring that. They are filtered all sorts of things going on that make women feel that their bodies should be that shape and size. If we think about the most famous Instagram family, the Kardashians, all of them had a wild amount of plastic surgery done on their faces and on their bodies, a lot of which they deny, and yet they hold themselves up as examples of what young people or anybody could achieve from their body if they just work hard enough, if they just exercise enough, if they're just dedicated enough with their diet. And that's completely false information. Their pictures are edited, airbrushed, their bodies are changed surgically, and that's causing significant, not, not just them, of course, but that whole uh, culture is driving huge body image issues among young people. Social media massively applies pressure to match an ideal body shape. And of course, unfortunately, now this isn't just affecting women, it's, it's hugely affecting men. One of the reasons there's been in the UK an absolute epidemic of eating disorders referrals that we cannot keep up to date with or, or up with in, the, in hospitals, let alone in outpatient settings where people are slightly less sick, 
Um, but between 2006 and 2020, rates for e referrals to eating disorders have doubled, and this has doubled again since the, since the beginning of the pandemic. And what we think is very closely linked with this is the increased social media use that we've seen at the beginning of the pandemic and throughout the pandemic, particularly amongst this 16 to 24 age group. And what we see online is these body ideals, these highly trained, surgically advanced and, uh, enhanced and edited bodies. They're now the goal for many people. Young people in particular don't necessarily recognize that they've been heavily edited or airbrushed or um, enhanced surgically. People think that this is what these women are born with or these men are born with in terms of body ideals. So it's a six pack thigh gap, large glutes. There's nothing that people can achieve there easily without being very restricted with their diet or having, having won the genetic lottery, as I like to say. What we know is that most women achieve a six pack at around 16 to 90% of body fat, but most women lose their fertility if their body fat percentage moves between, below 22. So most of the women with six packs and, and heavily defined abs that young people are aiming towards through social media won't have a period. And these sorts of things are affecting men as well with a loss of libido, low testosterone happening amongst young men who are also aiming for these very low body fat percentages. We also have a condition now coming through which we call muscularity oriented disordered eating or mode. It's massively on the rise. It previously only really affected men because it was only men that wanted to be really muscular and really, really lean. Women wanted it to just be the thin ideal, as thin as possible. But now many women are swapping anorexic behaviors for mode, which is what, but what happens is they believe their behaviors and their bodies are now healthy because they're so muscular that they think that's a positive thing and young people do too. And online, if anyone's interested in screening themselves or people around them, there is a really strong and really positive uh, muscularity oriented eating test, which includes a lot of the things that you'll see uh, glorified by social media, including having a strict diet plan, regular meal prep, not eating foods in restaurants, having a cheat day, uh, being anxious about not having enough protein in the house, all of these things that are really glorified on social media that are completely aesthetics focused and actually are disordered and nothing to do with health at all. And the sad thing is that Facebook knows, you may have seen this report come out, but Facebook knows that Instagram is toxic for teen girls. Uh, they know from in internal corporate data that was leaked by one of their, sort, but one of their um, workers that they make eating disorders and body image issues worse for one in three teens and that teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression and 6% of suicidal teenagers blame Instagram and they've done absolutely nothing about it since they collected their own data and put on themselves in 2019 and of course since then we had the pandemic and that huge increase in social media use. So I'm just going to um, briefly say, oh sorry the slide's not perfect, but in summary we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can to protect ourselves and other people. There is a real drive towards trying to improve the quality of information on social media. Myself and other dietitians are working hard to fight against the tide of misinformation. And it's my personal mission to try and raise as much awareness as possible of these issues to try and save as many people from the dangers. I see young women, older women, I see men, I see people with all kinds of conditions who come in and have been to my clinics and have been significantly harmed by things that they've read online, things that they believe to be true, things they were sold, products, things like that. And we must get a handle on this. It's, it's a public health emergency as far as I'm concerned. If you're thinking about yourself and how this, some of these things might have uh, affected you today, one of the things I'd really encourage you to do is look at your social media hygiene, unfollow anybody that leads to negative body comparisons with yourself. So if you're looking at somebody and you think, oh, am I bigger or smaller than them? Have they got better abs than me? Are their muscles bigger than mine? Unfollow them, they're not helping you. They might seem like fitspo and people that are inspiring you. They are causing you physical and, and emotional harm every day. Really think about questioning the credentials of the people that you're following and what they actually, are they actually qualified to give you any advice on nutrition or personal training or whatever it might be. When you're looking for information on nutrition, try and search without seeking confirmation bias. One of the things that we're all guilty of doing is, is putting into Google, is a plant-based diet the best thing for me? And of course, all the results that come up for you if you search for that will be things that support your hypothesis. And you're likely to only read the things that you want to read. So if you're trying to look up something about nutrition, try to look for the pros and the cons and look for both sides and try and weigh things up. It's incredibly difficult to do that without many years experience in the specific area of nutrition that you're looking at. 
look for government websites if you are looking for specific advice on nutrition and as much as Twitter, et cetera, will try to uh, downgrade your trust in the government in terms of nutrition, please do trust those websites. That's from the best experts in your country. Think about your motivation. Why are you doing it? Why does it matter how thin or fat you are? How does, why does it matter how big your muscles are? Why is that important? And please be really careful of the algorithm. Once you start liking and following people who have particular body shapes, your inbox will, or your, your feed will be inundated with more and more idealized bodies that can cause you physical and emotional harm. Definitely gone over 10 minutes. I have no idea by how much, but I am going to stop speaking now. <laughs> well, the truth is that um, I really didn't want to interrupt you because really what you're talking about um, is very close to my heart. I, I started out my profession as a clinical social worker working on an eating disorders unit in mm. Washington, DC, uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the issues are still there and mag getting magnified. And one of the things that we do know is that young women form their body images right around adolescence. Mm -hmm. And it lasts. You know, um, I still don't consider myself as thin as I really probably am, <laughs> given, um, again, you know, from, from body images at, at 13 years old. Mm -hmm. So your work is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, the challenge is incredibly important you've given some great things and again if this is an, an interest of yours hop on <laughs> because there's plenty of plenty of work to do and i'm sure so uh, sophie that you've got your information here that people can reach out to you and support the work that you're doing because it's monumental thank, so you. thank you yeah thank you so much okay so pooja is in the house and um pooja is our next guest speaker She's an Indian American community builder who grew up in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. She has degrees in economics and international studies from American University, where I also went, and now works on youth capacity building climate change, youth capacity building climate change and sustainable development with the Climate Initiative, Youth Climate Collaborative, and Youngo. Her purpose in life is to nurture her curiosity and creativity encourage herself and others to challenge the status quo and unite people to improve the quality of life for all. What a wonderful, wonderful um, purpose. So she's gonna to speak to us today on challenging the status quo, the importance of intergenerational collaboration for climate action and sustainable development. Please welcome Pooja. She's somewhere here on this screen. Yes, I'm here. There you go. Hi, everyone. Awesome. It's so great. We've got such a big audience today, 161 people. Amazing. Thank you all for taking the time to join. I'm going to share my screen. OK, let's see. Presenter mode. All right. You should be able to see the presentation. Can you see it? Great. So as discussed, my name is Pooja Tilvawala and I work um, with a few different organizations. So I primarily work with the Climate Initiative, which is based out of Maine in the US. And we work to empower youth voices for climate action. And I'm their youth engagement manager. And then I also run Youth Climate Collaborative and host a podcast called Dare to Envision. And then I'm active with the UNFCCC's children and youth constituency called Youngo. And today what I wanted to start off talking about is some challenges that youth face in trying to get involved and stay involved in the climate movement. And then I wanted to flip the script and talking about some solutions that are being implemented to move the conversation from doom and gloom to, I guess, boom and bloom is what I'm calling the opposite. <laughs> so let's see. So these are some challenges that youth are facing in the climate space. So one, of course, is financial need and limited resources. There's a lot of unpaid jobs and internships out there. And so there's um, organizations like Pay Our Interns by Carlos uh, Mark Vera that are trying to change that 
Um, then another one is uh, emotional challenges. So a lot of burnout, eco anxiety, climate grief going around. Um, I was just part of this cohort that has this learning journey developed for youth to take part in. Um, and I also run these climate courage workshops to help youth who are dealing with these emotions to have a safe space to discuss it with other people and build that community around um, young climate leaders and uh, the intersection between climate and mental health. Then there's sometimes difficulty in finding like-minded people in a community to do action with instead of doing it alone, especially with the pandemic when everybody was staying indoors more. It was often hard to feel like you had a group of people to take action with and that can be discouraging for taking action. We're seeing things open up again and more people are going out and trying to get involved. Um, and then there's sometimes limited or no access to mentors to share opportunities with and guide young leaders on their journey. And so this is where like even LinkedIn, like uh, we've used for this event can come in handy is um, trying to reach out to people who you think could help you because you never know when somebody will say yes or just doing a Google search for mentorship programs often helps too. Um, then Sometimes there's difficulty in finding a champion of youth to advocate for youth in various institutions. Let's say you want to do a project with an institution or you want to help um, change a system with a group of people, but sometimes you don't know who to begin with, who's gonna be on your side, or even in, um, right now I'm in LA for a few days um, for the Hollywood Climate Summit. And we were talking about how it's so important to find that champion of youth or champion of sustainability on the set that you're working on so that when you propose greenifying the set, they can help back up um, your opinions and your suggestions. Then sometimes there's limited network and networking opportunities. Uh, again, we're seeing that um, change a little bit with um, the pandemic and there's been a lot of virtual opportunities to network. So um, as long as you have access to quality internet and stuff. There's a lot of um, those opportunities to take advantage of. And sometimes people will not know how to get started or how to learn about how to get started. And all of these don't just apply to youth. I mean, they just apply to people generally as well to that want to take part in climate action. Um, for learning how to get started, it's nice to like Google um, an organization, uh, like just climate organizations near you. Um, and then I've developed this uh, eco action map where you can zoom into where you live to see um, what orgs are near you. Um, but I need to um, scale that and build that out more. Um, some other challenges. Um, one is a lack of youth seats and voices at decision making tables and meaningful engagement opportunities. So not just uh, youth washing, which is kind of like you have the young person show up at the table, but then not really provide the opportunities to speak or the um, necessary resources to prepare um, and be ready for the um, engagement. Then um, for this, what I've been doing is um, interviewing organizations that have youth and decision-making structures and seeing you know, what are their models, what's working well, what's not working. And then so that if we do go to orgs that don't have youth voices at these tables, um, we can say, here's how you can do it, not just please do this. Um, and then there's often low diversity in mainstream narratives um, in film and TV and op-eds. Um, we need to get more, um, BIPOC and LGBTQ and other um, communities voices out there, middle America, um, we need to know, you know, how is climate change impacting these communities? What can we do to help? Um, then sometimes there's an equating of less experience as incapability or doubting of skills. This is where, you know, recognizing that we can all learn from each other, no matter our ages, um, and finding the balance of the skills that younger people often bring to the table, especially with social media savviness, and the wisdom of, you know, people who have been 
in the space for a while and um, can use that experience to um, pass down knowledge. Um, then sometimes low diversity in the fields. Um, this is, you know, gender based diversity, racial diversity, all, many different types of diversity, especially in leadership positions. Um, how can we start changing this and training people if we are in positions of leadership? How can we train um, people whose voices have been generally excluded um, to be able to fill those positions? Um, or create the connections for them so that they can fill the positions when um, we leave. Then a lack of opportunities to gain relevant knowledge and skills. This really depends on where you're located. Um, some places have more, some countries like the US have more funding for climate related um, issues and knowledge sharing um, than other countries where governments do not wanna fund this and even, um, you know, punish people for um, discussing these issues. Um, then sometimes there's missed opportunities for highlighting green job pathways. How can we get um, schools and teachers to um, educate more about the different job pathways there are based on the different subjects that are studied? And how can we show um, the general public that any job can be a green job? And what does that mean? Um, and then how entities describe themselves and jobs describe themselves. So um, how can we encourage our offices of employment to um, build sustainability into strategy and the mission um, and goals of the organization? Because um, I don't have the research to back it, but I know I've read some things that have said that research shows that um, younger um, employees tend to want to work at workplaces that, you know, are socially aware and are taking action for social issues like climate change. Um, then, uh, yeah, there's a problem with this narrative of uh, climate change being a problem for future generations to solve, or that that's going to get passed down to just future generations. Of course, it's a problem for the collective um, that all of us need to solve working together. There's a lot that can be passed down from generations that have experience. So we really need that training and that um, collaboration to move forward. And then of course, the challenge um, that is getting a little bit better, um, internet access, computer phone access, um, you know, and with all this new technology and stuff coming out with metaverse and AR, We'll see how, you know, hopefully not many people are left behind in that. Um, now I want to shift focus um, and talk about what are some solutions um, for getting people to, for captivating people enough so that they feel that they should do something, that they care about climate change. So I wanna draw attention. Oh, there's these two quotes first. Um, there's a story being told that says the climate crisis is too big and that you don't have a role to play and it's time for a new story. And then we have the facts that uh, we have policy solutions to the climate crisis. What we don't have is the popular imagination and that's why we need artists. We need those new stories. How do we get people to reimagine a different future, to dare to envision something different, a new way of life, a new system, and then take the steps to get there. And it's not just the individual. How can we get companies and um, organizations to dream big, to reimagine what their systems look like instead of sticking with the status quo and doing things as they have been done or because the you know popular players in the space are doing things one way and saying, oh, we can't do that yet because they're not doing that yet and we need to stay professional. This is how things are being done. How do we change all that? Um, so this is just a little prompt. Um, wouldn't it be great if, and it's just a good question to ask oneself when you wake up, wouldn't it be great if, and you can fill in the blank. Um, I run the Dare to Envision podcast. I ask this question. These are some um, responses. Um, that 
the young leaders have given from where they're based, right? Like if everyone had access to clean drinking water, if there was more funding for climate adaptation and resilience, um, then yeah, so moving from doom and gloom to boom and bloom, um, things we can do to shift attention from challenges to solutions. One is by creating mini documentaries highlighting climate solutions. So Peak Action is this organization where this is what they're doing. They're um, going out, sending filmmakers and photographers to um, locations uh, where organizations are implementing these climate solutions just to make the solution side more mainstream. And so that you don't have to scroll through a lot of stories of disasters and the negative impacts alone. You can see the solution and the hopeful side of things. Um, and share more about that and then learn how maybe a solution adopted in one place can be adapted and used in another location. Then another thing is share about climate solutions on TikTok or on you know, various social media platforms. Um, share your own stories and your own climate solutions and things you're working on. Um, one example is the Eco Talk Collective, which is like these TikTokers who are sharing these stories of good action and you know memes and fun things to um, move audiences and um, have them you know move out of this mindset of doom and gloom. Then there's sharing of stories of reimagined futures. So that I mentioned in my Dare to Envision podcast, where um, I interviewed 50 youth who have dared to envision a better future way of life for themselves and their communities and are taking action to um, move closer to those visions. And so it's really, how can we ignite this courage, this bravery in everyone to be able to challenge the existing systems, the existing ways of life and see and imagine that something different is possible. You know, it's within the realm of reality um, to accomplish. We'll take hard work, but we can get there. Um, I would love to see more exercises for reimagining um, at workplaces and um, uh, just in day-to-day -day life, journal prompts, for example. Um, so this is this artist um, who I had the pleasure of connecting with in person last week, um, but uh, I've been following this work for a while. His name is Ben Von Wong, and he uses art as a vehicle for getting people to care about climate change. So on the left, you can see um, this plastic tap that he created, this art installation. It was um, put in Nairobi during the UNEA conferences in February earlier this year, um, where they were working on some plastics agreements. And then right now, currently, they've moved the installation to um, Portugal, where they're having the UN Oceans Conference right now. And so as you can see with this uh, tap, there's plastic flowing from it and it's, you know, say no to the plastic tap, close the plastic tap. Um, but when you see images like this, right, you can share them on social media, you can just send a powerful message of, you know, this is what's happening. Um, here you see Strawpocalypse on the right. Um, and I think this is one of the Guinness World Record for most number of straws used in an installation or something. Um, but this is some examples of art. I couldn't find a picture of the thermochromatic art stuff in time, but um, there's also thermochromatic art being used. Um, and this uh, paint um, changes color based on temperature threshold. So it can go from black to invisible, from red to green, and there's other um, variations. And so one of my colleagues, um, she was using this thermochromatic paint during a workshop in Miami where she asked um, people who would come to her table to draw their favorite place um, or places of significance to them. And then they would draw it and they were under a shaded area, but as soon as they went into the sun, the place would disappear, right? And then they would come back and be like, oh my gosh, this place disappeared. I have to do something about climate change. Um, so how can we use art more as a vehicle for like visual, uh, for helping people visualize um, the changes that could happen on the negative side? 
um, if we don't do something about climate change, but then how can we also use it to move people to care and show uh, a reimagined future as well? Um, that is the end of my presentation, short and sweet today. Um, but if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me um, on LinkedIn uh, at Pooja Tilvawala. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Pooja. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just waiting for the screen. There we go. And um, again, could you really kind of get her passion? There's something that you said, Pooja, that I just love that you're looking for people to help ignite uh, courage and bravery to ignite, uh, imagine a new future. And I think what you can see here from all the speakers so far, and I know we have two more fabulous speakers, these are people that are passionate about creating a movement and a movement starts from the ground. And um, so we congratulate each and every one of you for your passion and, and all the wonderful things that you are doing. And we hope that you'll save the chat, everybody. There is a wealth of help and information and people with, uh, from all over, literally all over the world that uh, you can, again, pick one of these wonderful projects and get involved. And the other thing that's so exciting to hear um, is, is about the youth. Um, they are our future and they are amazing. And again, the question about getting them not only to the table, but giving them the right to speak and that giving them the, the, the um, respect that they deserve because they are, they are our future and they have a lot more answers than many of us do at this point. So our next guest, and I've heard Larissa speak before and you're in for a treat, is Larissa Mills. She is a mental skills coach and a program coordinator for Team Canada, founder of iparentgen.com. We're gonna to have to put that in the, in the box, um, Lewis, and digital and mental wellness educator for athletes. Her experience arises from being an educational behavioral consultant, behavior and policy writer. Her research on cell phones, and here we, again, we have this theme of social media and how it's impacting our youth and then impacting everybody. Her research on cell phones and addiction revealed to her that there were behavioral changes happening in sports and in education. Larissa created a hybrid school that teaches mental skills for athletes to become unstoppable, called the Mental Game Academy for all kids. Larissa Mills is committed to keeping athletes healthy, happy, and in sports. And she's gonna to speak to us today, are sports sustainable for coaches, athletes, and our kids? So please welcome Larissa Mills. Thank you, thank you. I'm just gonna switch over. Can you guys see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So thank you. I, I, you got quite a lineup here of impressive people. I'm like crying. I'm happy. It's, it's just wonderful to see that we're, we have all these amazing powers that be um, to, to make change. And I, I'm not worried for my kids. I'm really quite like emotional. I find it very impressive. All right. So Mental Game Academy. So I'm here today to talk about whether or not sports are sustainable. They completely are, but we have to know where we're at in terms of how and why are the refs leaving? Why are the coaches leaving? Why are kids leaving? Why, why are we having less participation in sports on a global scale? So I had to think about this and do the math and I had to put it all together. And then I had to get the medical science and then I had to get the the um, mental health association statistics. I had to get the pediatric society statistics. What was happening? So we started to research it. I started to put it together. And it seems to be that since 2007, we've seen a big change in sports. And that was when the phones were introduced. Is there a link? We now know in 2022 and 2019 was the big year before the pandemic that we saw how phones were changing the way we process work habits, discipline, and how we are actually changing our neuroscience and how we're changing our habits. 
I watched a game the other day and I watched a mother <laughs> who screamed down the football field as their team was already winning 42 to seven and screaming after her kid to score and making a show of that. And then she yelled at the ref and then the ref very, very, he mediated very well. But I just think that sometimes I think we need to do some re-education. And there was this thing that came up in my head. Can we educate in a three-prong approach our way out of this funk in sports? And I think we can because I'm doing it. Association by association, by sport, by level, by programs, by bringing people on board in the Mental Game Academy, I have an incredible team around me. They're more talented than me. They're, they're amazing people. And we're all here for the same mission. Now, one of the biggest stats that we have and we've collected is that by 16 years old, 12,000 hours to 15,000 hours is approximately what a child spends on a phone. Now, here's the kicker. By 40 years old, a person will have been on for almost 20. So that is causing gaps in children or use ladder of development. So my background's in psychology. My master's is in how the brain learns. And right now our youth are not learning effectively. And not only are they not learning effectively academically, they're not learning how to socialize what etiquette is. They're not learning how to use the resilience. They're using their phones to critically think for them. There are many youth out there that I have met and have on our teams who are remarkable human beings. And I'm so glad that they're leading the other kids along. So we go into the teams and to associations and we use this three-prong approach because we know the statistics say that refs are leaving 33% or more a year on, a, on average per sport. 57% of the refs say that it's abuse from coaches and parents. And after me, I'm in an arena, I'm in a pool, I'm in a football. I, I mean, I go and I watch my athletes. Um, my kids are all involved in sports. I coach sports. I can safely say that in my environment, in my culture, I don't allow it. It doesn't happen. So I try and make sure that we're all happy, we're educated, and we all are well skilled to handle anything that comes our way. And that's sort of what we're, we're um, aiming to get at. But why are kids quitting at 13 instead of 16 when that was the big drop off? Well, a lot of the research is saying it's because children are coming with less tools in their toolbox. And this is where we come in and provide them with steps to mental skills, steps to emotional intelligence. Now we know that 83% of children are addicted to their phones by the age of 18. And that is a stat from 2019, by the way. So that's what we also have to consider. What is, what are, what is the constant phone use doing to the brain? and to our skills and habits. Well, I can tell you that one of the ones that I'm most concerned about is right here, is their critical thinking skills. They're not able to get the confidence to speak up. They're not able to get the confidence to manage their way out of bullying. They're not able, they're not even sticking up for friends anymore. They're not even able to make friends and do the, as much socialization as they used to when we look at the new statistics and from pediatric societies. Their resilience is down. They're not able to handle pressure as well. They're not able to handle the feedback from coaches and the pressure from parents. And I see that pressure daily. I am with these kids a lot during the weeks and for hours during our growth sessions to talk about these things and educate them. And that is the two top things. Abuse of um, coaching behavior is a problem, but it's also, we're not preparing our kids properly yet, but phones are one of those major factors that are contributing to why we're actually seeing a 16 year old who has the emotional development of 14 year old. So we are looking at changing how we educate. And one of the things that we're doing here at the Mountain Game Academy is trying to ditch the, the social media, get them down to one app instead of five apps, because basically every night they go from TikTok to Instagram, YouTube, back to TikTok, back to Instagram, back to YouTube. And, and this is something, and then they're on their Snapchat and they're taking photos. And let me tell you, Kids, after 10 o'clock, nothing good's happening. Just like we say, nothing good happens after midnight with adults. Well, nothing really good happens after 10 o'clock in a uh, child's bedroom when they're home alone or in their rooms alone. So 
we have different um, routines and screen routines that we have for families, for different athletic families. So um, all phones are on the main floor. They're not allowed in their rooms. They can't go to sleep with them and they can't wake up with them. And that's really for their own brain benefit, their moods, their energy. And we're trying to prevent phone addiction here. So we know that this is collected evidence from four pediatric societies that I use. So Canadian, American, British, and Australian. But the one thing that I want to point out on this page is one in six kids are medicated and they don't need, they don't need to be. Many of the, the pediatricians are very focused on let's build these skills up in the kids. Let's decrease their phone time and let's get these kids out there socializing. And for me, I want them to find something they love, find something they, do you like archery? Well, you can be an amazing hockey player and make team Canada, which this, these girls are, but let's find other things you like. And it seems to help with that balance, but it's almost <clears throat> like we're using phones to find our other thing. And that's not healthy either. There is a downward spiral of participation in sports across, but what's really breaking my heart is the amount of girls that are dropping out and not even re-signing up. I'm talking 26 to 36 percent less girls are signing up in a sport each year. That is a lot higher than the 19, I think 16 percent for boys. So here's a cycle and this cycle is the athletic cycle with no change. If we don't intercept if we don't interfere, if we don't educate, this is just a downward spiral cycle. So the associations who don't have the strong board members who want to make these changes or are doing what's best in a value system, and I know Jeff and I had this conversation, this is where a value system is so vital for all of youth development in your programs. Coaches, we have declining numbers. But when we actually go and I train, uh, you know, these coaches at these elite levels and, and, and even grassroots levels, um, we see that they just need to be, feel a little bit more equipped. They just need some more connective tools. They need some more strategies. And that's what we're here for, to help them teach their athletes mental skills and emotional intelligence, leadership, coping mechanisms. That's us. And then they go off and they can implement them into their practices and into their games <laughs> and be less abusive to refs. And they can help manage parents. So really what we need to do is also empower our coaches. The athletes, we can empower them and help educate them as young as 12 years old. We do have a little We Sharks program. It was really cute. My son's teams and a whole bunch of teams did it. And actually, the younger the kids, the more effective it is. So I'm really hopeful that those changes, when associations, when we meet with them, or leagues, or even working with foundations, um, and helping the kids become more educated about themselves and more fearless and more confident athletes and how they can manage their parents' critique in the car on the way home. That is a big reason why kids are quitting sports today. That's the second one, number reason why kids are quitting. By educating parents, we have five courses or six, now we have more than that, I, I lost count here, but we actually have courses that associations can use to help educate their parents, to help their kids with phone habits, sleep, um, steps to resilience, steps to emotional intelligence, leadership, how to cooperate and how to be a great team player, right? And a great role model. And then this affects also the refs. We need to <coughs> educate the refs and they need to feel equipped. And let's look at the cycle here of refs. More refs are leaving, but only younger people are replacing them who want a job. So they're actually coming in with, they're more shy, they're not as assertive, they're not owning their game. So we have a cycle here that unless we intervene and offer education at all of these circles here, we are going to see a real decline in sports and we're going to only allow sports to be for the wealthy. And that's simply not something I'm not willing to, this is my not, not, <laughs> this is what I'm not going to not let happen. It can't just be for the wealthy kids. Sports can't just be for the wealthy. We need to develop way more kids at the bottom. So more and more reach higher platforms. And I don't mean just sports. I mean, arts, I mean, drawing, I mean, music, I mean, theater, I mean, drama, whatever the thing is, we're seeing the numbers declining across everything. So here are all the reasons in which we need to examine and address. And these systems and three-prong approach that we do take 
are addressing all these issues. And I don't want to go too long. So um, there's, there's about seven or eight reasons, but um, parenting has changed. That's a big one. Parents need to teach their kids mental skills and parenting needs to actually alter a little bit to be more aware of how phones are affecting their children. Um, Sophie, a wonderful job talking about so social media as we're trying to change that for our athletes to see where who they're following and who they're unfollowing because of the misinformation out there about their bodies. Because I've never seen this high amount of body image issues in our athletes. I thought before the pandemic, it was high. It is there are more boys not taking off their shirts who are chiseled <laughs> and as you said muscular and they're beautiful young men and and they won't take their shirt off to go swimming even though they're an elite player for uh like uh, their country i'm like i'm i'm floored by this body image and what's happening here for boys as well um if we look at the some of the reasons the car ride home from parents can be very rough i'm so lucky that my dad was awesome at that like, if you want to talk about it, you can talk about it. If you don't want to talk about it, you know, you made a lot of effort, whatever you want to do. And that's how I do it with my kids. You know, we talk about anything, but having that car ride home, no phones, just chatting is pivotal. Let they, these kids today have had 10,000 hours less by 16 of socialization, right? Because they're individually at home in a phone, on a phone, parent coaches, part of the structural, um, models of how each individual sport is set up is not helping uh, athletes to develop as well. And we need to also look at whether or not parent coaches at certain levels are effective or ineffective. Um, there's so many different things here that I could discuss, but I'm going to skip along. Um, if we look at an athlete's career here, starting at younger and eight and grassroots, like finding out what their thing is and um, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Netherlands, England, Scotland, they do great jobs at getting kids out into participation. And I kind of find it's like the feeling out stage. What do you like? Do you like ballet? Do you like, do you like golf? Do you like swimming? This is the greatest part for kids to put them in public programs and figure out what their thing is. And then hopefully they stick with two or three things and they evolve and become dynamic. Because those countries that place a value system on a child being well-rounded, I have to say, they're not seeing the same issues that we're seeing here in the US and parts of other countries. We're not. We're not seeing the same levels of anxiety. We're not seeing the same structure. We're seeing them handle, they're more resilient than, than North American children. And that's across the board. So this chart here says, approximately a child can come de can develop between 12 and 27 and they kind of leave their profession if they hung in that long out of basically it's one in one million kids right to become a professional that's really hard you have to beat all these kids out and that resilience just isn't there and if they have it these kids are are making it and that's where I really want to see more kids uh, develop. Now, if you're looking at it as individual sports, yes, of course there will always be sports that have more kids because simply money like soccer, baseball are not as expensive as hockey. Football is even more expensive than either of those two. Horseback riding, definitely not, right? Like you have to look at the, also the math in sustainable sports. So our three prong approach, we educate the coaches, the parents and the athletes. And what happens is if we don't educate one of these corners, you can't have a triangle and it won't work. If, if we don't educate the parents, then we're going to constantly have issues and we're still going to lose coaches and we're still going to lose athletes and we're going to have issues at the association level. If we don't help the coaches, they won't stay in coach based on the last surveys that I saw. Um, if we don't educate the athletes and bring them up to their emotional development level at their age group, we are going to see some other issues and they're going to see less athletes. And I don't want the kids to stay home and be sad. I want them to be out. I don't care what sport they choose. I don't care if they want to play ping pong. I don't care if you, they want to dance or act, but they got to have a thing that makes them want to get up with intent every day. And right now we're seeing too many kids in schools, not having a thing. The phone is their thing. And that is definitely not healthy for them at all. So we, how do we support the athletes? Well, really quickly, we give them courses and contents and programs. And they, the one thing I want to say about our program is that you can actually teach for us. Once you go through our program, we want kids, teens, 
uh, teaching with us so that they can help with their skills. And I like how Loretta, this is all about development. This is all about them building themselves, right? So they get a letter of reference and they get a certificate. And I'm really proud of that program because it's really empowered a lot of young uh, men and women. So we teach them self-talk, how to stop negative self-talk. And Sophie and um, I think Idiola was talking about our youth and one way in which we can help them come to the table and have those amazing talks like Pooja, right? Your talk was just so great. And I really like that, that you are empowered. So giving kids these tools will bring more forward. Okay, so there are other techniques in psychology that we teach the kids. We teach them listening techniques because right now a lot of kids don't look at the eyes of people. They look at the ground and then the coaches have to repeat. We give them feedback strategies, reset strategies, visualization. So a lot of kids aren't being taught these. So of course, at a higher level of sport, they're not going to be chosen because they don't want to do the extra teaching. And that, that breaks my heart because these kids are they really can develop. We support the coaches. We have coaching training modules. So we have two portals off of our website. You get assessed by your mental skills and then we put you on a pathway to your, your growth, right? And, and your development. So we have that for athletes and for coaches. So we also have that parent culture I was talking to you about. If we don't improve our, our culture overall through all parts of that triangle, we aren't gonna move forward. We aren't gonna be sustainable in any shape. It's not going to work, especially at the high impact sports. That's where we see this really impacting as well. So we actually help educate the parents. We do talks. We have courses for associations to put on their website, but we want to breed a culture we want to thrive in because the kids need to thrive. And right now they're barely surviving their age group. They're behind in their psychological skills. They're behind in their confidence. And if we can empower these kids, I think climate change is going to look like no problem at all. And I'm saying that honestly, I think if we can empower our youth, this is a no brainer. So we know that we can help the kids uh, learn that sports are all them, all mental, all game. So are their, or so was their music, so was their arts, but educating our youth, like Idiola was saying is, is vital, is vital to our future. And I'm so happy to be a part of that. That's it. Wow. <laughs> well, so I left my email in the chat. For sure. If people want to connect or chat or they want to learn parts of our program or um, they want to take our courses, I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Larissa, thank you again. Um, again, we share. What I love about what Larissa does is she nails the problem and has solutions. So I've been in this field for a long time. My program is called Mastery Under Pressure, and it came from the same thing of being a parent of elite athletes and the coaches and the parents and the, the whole nine yards. But what I also, what's so impressive in all the work around the youth, and we know that if you have two people going for a job interview, and this one has the mental skills, exactly, and this one doesn't, they could have the same level of whatever right. this one's right. going to get it yeah and out of the thousand kids coming to a tryout only i pick the most resilient ones who have the most intelligence after i analyze their skills yes right. so we're going to move on one more time to jeff but my my father was a great athlete and um he used to say anything that you need to learn in life you can learn on the ball field <laughs> and then I <laughs> repeated that to somebody and, he's, and he said, well, yes, that's true, but you need somebody to transfer the skills. So you could have a, you could be on the ball field and you could have a coach that's screaming at the kids. That's not going to go, you know, and what you're doing is you're helping to transfer the skills from the, from the ball field to life. And um, again, I applaud the work that you're doing. Okay. And for our last fabulous speaker is Jeff Thompson. And he is a five time, and Jeff, I'm sure you know a lot about the mental game. <laughs> He's a five times world karate champion. He has a 35 year track record in social and human development of young people, 
and delivers social and human initiatives on CSR, EDI, and the legacy benefits to communities globally. And again, you, you know, when you talk, maybe you'll tell us what CSR is and EDI. He is the chair of the Youth Center, an international charity and a UN NGO, board member of the London Legacy Development Corporation, advisory board member of the Mohammed Ali Center, former chair of the board of the University of East London, and is currently chair of the Professional Footballers Association and Deputy Chair of the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. Wow. So he's gonna to talk, to uh, talk to us about sport and physical activity in the mental, physical, and emotional health and well-being of youth and communities. And we welcome you, Jeff. Thank you. I'm going to do what everyone else has done over the last number of hours, which is to share my screen. And in doing so, hopefully in part, in a very succinct manner, the ask, the story, the call to action, and what I believe brings together all that I've listened to and heard from my esteemed panelists and to my organizers who I wish to thank also for affording me this opportunity. Um, I come at this from a very reversed journey as I take you through these slides, I know Marissa will agree the visualization that's taking place as I do so comes to my founding slide, which was sport as a legacy opportunity for all. And when I looked at defining a legacy and it, what amounts to what we leave behind, it is about an equal, diverse and inclusive global community. It is about being corporately socially responsible because the interactive age that our young hearts and minds are now seduced and addicted to are driven by corporate interests. But as Larissa said, we have to have a common purpose and a common set of values that will see our young people and communities in a city, suburban or rural, locally or globally, on each of any of the continents, I believe enjoy the fundamental human right of sporting, artistic and cultural activity in a well-rounded global citizen of rights and responsibilities. I'm a product of the 20th century, the very social grassroots development performance and excellence that grew from the inequalities that I suffered because of the color of my skin, which is now the quality of my skin that I'm comfortable in, but my social, um, cultural, economic deprivation and disadvantage. The martial arts was afforded me as a means of being able to simply have the mental, physical and emotional resilience and armor to withstand the challenges of life. I'm eternally grateful to those intolerant human beings who chased me in the streets, but a young widow of a mother who decided I learned to defend myself. And through that, I learned a curriculum for life, self-discipline, traveled the world, and had an incredible journey from streets to stadiums, occasionally to the rostrum and back to the streets. But it has always been with the understanding that sport must be equitably diverse and inclusive for all. 29 years ago, I was very much, as the potential bad boy made good, very much reflecting what 95% of the global winners in sport represent. They all come from socioeconomically deprived backgrounds, and a good number of them could have been behind bars or positively contributing to society. It's another consequence of when we do not allow an equally diverse and inclusive educational, healthy outlook to life where society and communities foster an environment, a climate that sees us the product of our environment and contributing positively to our communities and society as a whole. 29 years ago, a 14 year old schoolboy was shot dead on the street of Moss Side in Manchester, an area of historical deprivation. Manchester were bidding for the Olympics for 2000, and I was compelled to go back to the streets because I realized something had gone badly wrong. What I'd had provided for me was not provided for this young schoolboy. And it heralded the gang culture, which is a result of poverty and lack of opportunity in mainland Britain. I decided to launch, launch a charter because we have royal charters in this country. So I thought we needed a youth charter because we don't have a youth ministry in this country. And it was simply to provide through sport an opportunity to develop in life. 
I enlisted sportsmen and women, that's me on the left, possibly your right, because sometimes it's good to be different. But there you will see everything from race, disability, gender, whom you love, whom you don't, because as many would have said, then it's none of your business. But nonetheless, it was completely inclusive. And there are over 30 Olympic, world and European titles that I brought to highlight this charter and its importance. We've a proven pioneered campaign and brokered 29 year journey that has inspired the sport for development for peace movement. The office was developed at the UN in New York and has now relocated to Geneva. But how do we work collectively within the qualities of team sport that allows the sustainable development goals, the sport physical activity and an ability to model, frame and provide impact that supports the evidence and the data that tells us half of our global population will have no future world to inherit. We engage them through sport, art, culture and digital technology, but not at the expense of the software between their ears. We equip them with emotional intelligence, resilience and armour and an aspiration where they can be the best that they can be. And when we empower them with an ambition of further higher education, employability or entrepreneurship. To not do that is simply false hope. And our young people are too informed by their interactively thumbs and the 15 seconds of attention that they either have by choice, simply another opportunity or platform upon which to be engaged. We have developed over this journey of major games. All major games will talk about legacy, but legacy is what you leave behind. And we believe that sport, art and cultural activity, which is highlighting the games, allows us to work together and leave something tangible of social, cultural, and economic impact that's a win-win-win for young people, communities, and society as a whole. Our projects and programs emanate from a community campus because we believe, as young people have said, as they're on the streets, they need somewhere to go. Whether it's one facility or a group of facilities, that is the campus. We need a curriculum for life, something that brings back to life our curriculum the classroom, the playground, beyond the school gate, informal or formal, because it's something to do. Young people have far more diversity of choice. They are discerning consumers, and they know when we're selling them something that they don't want to work hard to achieve. But thirdly, someone to show them. As Larissa said, we are losing the participation because we don't have social coaches in my mind that develop relationships of trust, competence, and respect and a lifelong journey that's in our community, from our community, with our community. The issues are clear. We use five sustainable development goals of the 17, in education, health, citizenship, the environment, and college, university, employment, and entrepreneurship. As I said, those are the five that we believe model what I believe needs a collaboration of holistic and integrated approach. But as I've said earlier, we have the stats, we have the data, we have the goals, and they can be adapted to those five core goals to reflect the local and influenced community. But to my mind, it's an intergenerational effort, but with young people at the very heart of our effort. What I'm going to show you now is the community campus, because as it comes alive, it is something that's very real. It's very much interactive, but it allows real time data. It brings everything together and was a result of many years of consultation before the pandemic, and we refined it during the pandemic. It is about bringing everything together. And if we do that, we can be more effective and efficient with our resources, our time, our energy, our inspiration, and provide the all important confidence of investment because we know our young people have moves, skills, gifts, and potential that we simply need to give them a chance to shine. This portal can be replicated in any community globally, but it allows us to work collaboratively. And the power of collaboration provides everything that we need to make the case we need to make. The project management, the flow, is all about the back end of what we do and the very detailed nature of what I believe we need to produce with policy, strategy, and the more efficient and effective use of resource. 
at the end of the day, the output is participation, but the outcomes are those sustainable development goals that create that sustainable ecosystem. We have a call to action. Five continents, 50 community campuses, 50,000 social coaches recruited, selected and deployed from the community, by the community, with the community. Five million young people directly engaged with multiple millions of young people making up the hundreds of millions. Many people have said, why are we so ambitious? <laughs> well, it's very simple. When a young priceless life does not have this opportunity, I've seen them dead on not their feet, but the streets. In a city, suburban or rural, first world or third world, poverty leads to gangs, haves and have nots. I believe sport and the arts is a vaccine and an antidote. It is not the treatment, it is not the solution. But I do believe that the right people for the right reasons and the right purpose can provide hope and opportunity. I was involved with the late President Mandela in post-apartheid South Africa, where he wanted to use sport and the arts as a vaccine to avoid a race war. And I walked into the townships and the haves and the have-nots of the Afrikaans and saw what could be achieved. What I share with you there is something that I will share with you when I have finished sharing my incredible journey in being here with you today. But the urgency has never been more evident. Marissa's points, data, and facts are real. These are all the issues that we now deal with, that we now are active in our wish to see them resolved. But as I've learned, only young people can make that happen, and we have to give them the resilience to do so. The social justice for sport for development is equally there. Those images, if shared, would tell a story, and story inspire lives. Our philosophy and vision is there, but ultimately it's inspired by Madiba. Vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is merely passing time. Vision with action can change the world. So I ask you to come together, become a team, become a movement. Let's give our young people hope and opportunity and a legacy opportunity for all then we'll be able to feel very comfortable as we leave the world to those who will inherit the world. Thank you for listening. Wow. Um, Jeff, I think that you have um, really put the icing on the cake. <laughs> um, Waiting for the actually if you'll stop sharing your screen, I, I think I could see everybody else again. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. That's all right. There uh, we go. Stop. Let's see. Oh, I should do that. There we go. There we go. Okay. So yes, you have put the icing on the cake. And um Larissa, you were in tears before, and I just in tears now. Um, what I have been able to surmise <clears throat> from the wonderful speakers that we've had, sport, the arts, youth, um, movements, working together worldwide, you people have answers. You know, a lot of times, oh, we have so many problems. We have so many, well, there are, there are answers. And we just need more people to collaborate and come together to actually make these things happen. And um, we're gonna move, move it on in just a minute back to our, our, our wonderful Loretta. Um, but I'm gonna take this day as something very special. I have it recorded. <laughs> I'm going to share it. Um, I know lots of people that would, would and could get involved had, if they knew what you were doing. So I'm just thrilled to have you all. And um, I'm gonna send it back to Loretta, I do believe. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's give Tina a round of virtual applause. She did a magnificent job. Thank you so very much. And if you don't know, she's on the West Coast. So she's three hours ahead of me. And she looks fabulous, like she's been up all day. You go, girl. You yeah. do good. <laughs> I heard uh, wonderful themes and the main theme is we have to engage our youth. We have to give them the credibility and honor who they are. 
And while they grow in their wisdom, we as elders must support them in that capacity. And I am all for it. I, I someday would like to have a planet that my grandchildren and great grandchildren can live on with free air that is clean, that there's a limitation of food instability, the insecurities of food. I would love to see it where young people can grow to be adults and they can do it through sports, which I did. I played basketball. I was a guard. I was a point guard. Don't sleep on me now. I got some skills. <laughs> But the important thing is sports is the thing to help me engage my identity and to help me frame the character that I have built today. And I'm excited that you all had a theme that was critical and important. Um, Tina, absolutely. This is being recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube page. It'll be posted on our website and we'll be posting segments of it throughout LinkedIn to engage the LinkedIn community for participation. Um, I am so excited that I, I just want to share with you guests that you will be see, receiving your certificate of membership for being a part of us. We want to make sure we keep this engagement going. We want to make sure we keep this conversation flowing. And speaking of conversations, last year when we had our summit, we were challenged. Dr. Neil Parson challenged us. He was so amazed about the work that was done in the conversation that was taking place that he threw down the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. And when he threw down the gauntlet, we picked it up. We sure did. Now, Ambassador Retired, Dr. Neil Parsad is a diplomat, a global health policy consultant, energy advisor and management consultant. He is the co-founder and managing director of Parson Cross, a Washington DC based global strategic advisory firm where he serves as senior advisor. Dr. Parson is a special advisor to the World Bank Group, Denton, which is the world's largest law firm. Now through his international business experience executing global projects with focus in the Caribbean and Latin America. Dr. Parson is the founder of the Your 24 seven doc. It's a telehealth company. He was the ambassador extraordinary and planetary to the United States of America, ambassador to Mexico and permanent representative of Trinidad Tobago to the Organization of American States. He held the cabinet position of Executive Secretary for Integral Development, OAS. Dr. Parson is the Chairman of the Board of the Global Alliance for Surgical Obstetrics, Trauma, and Anesthetic Care, Chairman of the Global Gas Council, Chairman of the International Gas Union, Global Ambassadors Network, and Director of the Youth America's Business Trust. He is an honorary member of the International Committee on HIV AIDS on Capitol Hill, the Women's Foreign Policy Group, the American Association of People with Disabilities, and American Societies. He earned his undergraduate in medical degree at the University of West Indies, where he graduated with distinction a master's of business administration, where he graduated as top student with distinction. He was awarded an honorary doctorate for education, culture, and humanitarian work from the Americana University. Ambassador Parsad is also on the board of advisors of the National Student Leadership Foundation of the USA. And now our beloved Dr. Prasad is the very first recipient of the Global Sustainability Partnerships, the first legacy award for his work in global health, inclusion, and sustainability. Now, Dr. Parsad will also receive a coveted seat with the WOCPSEN's International Advisory Council. 
Now the ISC supports global gender equity through academic equity. Dr. Prasad will sit on this illustrious council with our members, Dr. Jennifer Turpin, former provost and vice president of academic affairs for the University of San Francisco, Dr. Agana Chatterjee, research anthropologist and founding co-chair for political conflict, gender, and people rights initiative at the Center for Race and Gender at University of California. Dr. Barbara Mark, former governor's chair for Women's Global Leadership Initiative. Ms. Victoria De Alba, president of De Alba Communications. Ms. Denise McClara Query, retired Naval officer. Ms. Dana Verde, filmmaker, writer, producer, director and the Lorraine Hansberry Theater that is located in the African-American Arts and Culture Complex in San Francisco, California. Please extend a virtual hand clap of congratulations as we present Dr. Neil Prasad. Thank you very much, Loretta. You have me blushing here, I'm actually sitting in Florida, I live in Washington DC and it's, it's awesome to hear um, your kind words to me, number one and number two, even more impressive listening to the, the speakers before me. I was tremendously enlightened by their comments, particularly when I joined the conversation with Lar 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 Larissa and, and Geoff and I really wish to extend a hand of congratulations to all of them for the work that they are doing. You know, I often argue that all of us are leaders in our own right in whatever we do, you know, from stay-at-home moms to stay-at-home dads, all the way up to presidents of the United States, we are all leaders. And our responsibility is to leave this world a better place than we met it. And having people play their small part in the, in the manner in which they are doing it gives me a great level of hope and a great level of, of, of energy and enthusiasm in continuing the work that we all do. Because, you know, Rome was not built in a day, nor, nor was it built alone. And it takes all these small efforts to, 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 to summate themselves to become something synergistic and great. And I think that's what we're all about on this call. And, and on that note, let me also extend absolute congratulations to you, Loretta, and your hardworking team. It has been a pleasure to collaborate with you over time. And you know, it, this is beyond collaboration. I will tell you why. Collaboration suggests to me, you know, we all talk it through and try to come up with solutions and I'm happy that we have problem solvers on the call, but I think we actually need to go from collaboration to cooperation and collusion. We need to almost subliminally collude to fix these things, these issues. And, 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 the, and those verbs are fairly powerful if we take them to heart. And again, congratulations to you. And thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing and um, your team is doing to try to bring these players together. And it's not just the players, I, I, I observed with curious intent, the, the quality of, of and diversity of your listening audience. It's geographically widespread and vertically deep, you know, meaning that I'm seeing people from all walks of life, including those who are affected by some of these problems and those who are able to proffer solutions to some of these problems. And I think that in and itself suggests the collective and and, and, and convening power of your organization. And please don't take that for granted. Please don't take that for granted. There's a lot to be done and a lot, you know, that can be done with, with, with an organization like this. Having said that, I am very much appreciated and humbled by, your, by, by the outreach of your team to offer me this Legacy Award and I, and I, and I accept it with great humility. And I, I don't accept it on my own behalf personally. I really accept it on behalf of all those who are contributing on this call and elsewhere to, to make, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not trying to be altruistic. I mean that with purposeful intent. I have, and all of us have accolades hanging all over the place in our homes, but it, it reminds us of why we do the work that we do when we, when, when we take a peep at them, right? And, and, and I would use that, 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 that award and that spirit to, to keep me motivated. But you know, on, on that note also, let me tell you what keeps me up at night, the climate. I'm listening to the good work that everybody's doing, but all of this could wither to zero if we don't have a planet to live on. And, you know, I've been an ambassador and I'm a minister and so on and so on working in these 
in these fields. And I really appreciate the efforts of the global community to make some of this happen. But let me tell you how grave this thing is. And I don't want to end this great event on a on, a, on, a, on an alarming note, but sometimes it helps us to appreciate the challenges ahead. You know, a child born in 2000, just before the pandemic, between the pa pandemic and the year 2000 when the century turned, they are likely to experience, you know, a population of over 11 billion people. Right now we have around seven, seven and a half. 11 billion people, and they will be about 2.6 degrees warmer than where we sit today. I am sitting in Florida at my in-laws home. I left Washington DC and the day before I was in New York and a week before that I was in South Africa. I left South Africa at seven degrees Celsius. I went to Washington at, and granted that's the that's winter. I went to Washington at, at, you know, call it 14 degrees Celsius. I use Celsius rather than Fahrenheit coming from the Caribbean. Hit New York, it was about 14, 15 degrees, came down to, to Florida. Today here is 37 degrees. Dallas is going to hit 41. And this was not on record years ago, a few decades ago. So those who wish to deny climate change, I would really like to educate you on some realities we face coming from the Caribbean. I have seen countries destroyed in 15 minutes, literally, St. Vincent, Dominica, Jamaica. I've literally seen economies wiped out in 12 minutes because of a category five storm. And our children are being exposed to that. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I think the impacts of these changes would be you know, distributed unevenly. We are seeing the inequities across the board. Coming from the Organization of American States, we work very closely with 34 countries of, of the hemisphere. And a big, big challenge is what we call climate-induced migration from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Belize, Mexico, all moving north to avoid the effects of climate change and what that means. And I know this topic was discussed, but the wealthier communities are, are, are being affected and the poor communities as well. And both directly and indirectly, it's affecting our ecosystem functions. These extreme weather events, as you know, is really causing social as well as economic Displacement. I think the policies and decisions we make today will affect the outcomes of the remainder of this century and beyond. And I think the youth, the focus has been on youth, and I'm very, very happy that you're focusing on that. We'll have a large stake in that future. And again, I have a great level of confidence in what they're doing today, but I think the faith, the faith of the world is in the hands, heads, and hearts of youth. And I think from what I heard from Larissa and, and Jeff and so on, molding them internally to play that role externally is something we should not underestimate and totally, totally encourage. Let them see the macro and not just the individual and micro, right? And how do we do that? How do we galvanize around that team? I think the, the youngest generations may feel that they have the smallest ability to impact these devastating effects of climate and the, some of the problems we created. We created some of this and the generations before us did as well. But how do we build that momentum to help them without having them feeling they have the burden on their, on their own shoulders? You know, across the planet, we are seeing many youths expressing dissent towards economic, social, and environmental policies and practices. And this does contribute to the climate solution in, in, in many diverse ways. But clearly, not all forms of these climate activism has, would have the same impact. And in some cases, it's having repercussions. They're, be sh they're being shunned for it. And we have, to, we have to call it out for what it is. We have heard, we have seen it on posters globally, change the system, not the climate. And that disheartens me to hear that. Because yes, we need to change the system, but we need to mitigate what we have done with the climate. And I'm gonna focus on this climate issue for a minute because people talk of climate change. My friends, I stopped using that word climate change about six years ago because I believe the climate has changed. It's now about climate smart action. What can we do to mitigate and what can we do to adapt? Because I have taken it for granted we have changed the climate already. All we are doing now is buffering the impacts of making it worse, right? And that's where youth come in. 
few would argue that that they need to transform the system, but also meet the challenges of this new climate. And the question then becomes, how can young people contribute to, to change within a, within a really contrasting political climate that is marked by very powerful interests, strong rhetoric, and weak action on actual climate change itself? I paid very clo close attention and I've actually attended a couple of them at the Paris Accord and you know COP26 and understanding the politics of it there and what that means. Uh, but we see that kind of youth dissent expressed through action ranging from symbolic, act, some, you know, some symbolic acts to one of political mobilization. But clearly not all forms are the same and not all forms are welcomed. I've seen politicians dismiss the efforts of youth. I've also seen many embrace them. But surprisingly little attention is being given to actually analyzing the expressions of dissent among the youth and their impacts on politics and the power of, the, of these relationships. But here's the thing, as young people grow, they will aspire to, towards a voting age. And it will be important for them to use that power to spark that change and for us to enable them. Our only responsibility at this point is to help enable them in addition to solving the problem. And if they believe that none of the candidates are up to the task, then young people themselves should be running for office. And I, and I say that with no malice in my mind because I've yesterday, coming from the Caribbean, there's a very small island north of Trinidad and Tobago where I'm from, that's Grenada. The prime minister has been there for, for six terms. He was replaced by a 44 year old year last night in an election. 44, one would argue that's middle age, but it's still young. But the question is how do we mount, how do we mount an effort to get those voices in, in, office, in positions to, to play a role? And you know, if we don't, the evidence is mounting against us. The World Bank had actually established that by 2030, 135 million people will be pushed into poverty. Right now it's about, it's about 68 million, 135 million. So inequity, inequality, lack of parity will only be exacerbated if this continues. My own research has shown that most of the dire projections for future economic damages in the current, science, current scientific literature hold true. Climate change would reverse the gains of the past few decades and cause inequality between countries to rise again. So all the efforts we have been making could be wiped out if we actually don't make that political and power effort to dismantle the systems. It's almost a monopoly in many countries. I have traveled and almost in the poorest economies, a large part of the population depends di directly on, on, on the activities that they are blamed for. Uh, but these activities are most affected by climate change, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, etc. People with the lowest incomes are the ones most likely to depend on their mere survival on these resources provided by nature. If we don't stop it, we're in trouble. And I want to leave you on one last note because I don't want to harp on this issue. But, but I was telling you the issues that keeps me up at night. Climate, the effects of climate affects three things. It affects of, among many things. But for the survival of our youth and our world at, at large, food, energy, and water, which is essential to human well being, is, is a nexus that directly, is it directly impacted on climate change? Why? Energy production and food production, especially where irrigation is required, compete for very, very limited water resources. If you go back in history, almost every single major war since civilization started, started with water. Water wars, they were called in those days. And we are faced with the same challenge today. And water feeds agriculture. And most of the energy systems require water to to produce energy. So it's an interesting challenge we have, we have ahead of us. These challenges will be particularly severe in highly urbanized and densely populated areas. And the projections are not very good for the year 2050. We have few resources to deal with them. And we have, a, in my view, a fairly large, a fairly robust opportunity to enable youth to help solve them. I am very, very encouraged with what we have before us. You know, when hearing the previous speakers, I'm, I'm even more encouraged to see 
people are, are breaking up these niches in certain areas to try to fix these things. But I would really encourage you guys. I, I don't want to challenge you guys again, Loretta, but I will. You see the, the battery of speakers you had here and in their small way trying to, to bring this together. Let's actually make it happen because I think these small little actions would have ultimately a summative effect on how we can actually produce some tangible results going forward. This is not about producing a report that becomes a very expensive shelf document somewhere. It's actual action. And the solution lies within every single one of us on this call and way beyond this call. And you know, to make this happen, I, I call it a fleet of ships. We need ownership of the cause. We need stewardship of the process. We need leadership of action. We need partnership among all the stakeholders. And we need friendship among all of us to make this happen. I thank you very much for what you have done. And I congratulate all of you on this call and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and yes, you did outstanding, outstanding. We're just excited that you're a part of our, our little world. And we have something I call the not not, and everybody knows the not not, when you cannot not do what you do. It gets you up, like it keeps you uh, from sleeping. That's why I get up at four o'clock in the morning because I got to do what I have to do. You're so committed to it that your soul will not rest until you work with what you're working with. And I'm excited that we'll pick up the gauntlet again. I love a challenge. I'm retired. I have nothing to do all day. Give me challenges. <laughs> it keeps me busy and it keeps me out of my daughter's hair. And she's very happy to hear that. <laughs> so we are, thank you so very much, Dr. Parson. We are engaged and we're excited that we'll have a continue and a lasting relationship with you as well as everyone. And I tell you, once you're in my heart, you're in my heart. You can't get out. All y'all in my heart. So don't say anything when I'm texting you on LinkedIn or if your number's listed and I call you. Don't act like you don't want to pick up because I don't care. I'm going to keep bugging you. Unless you tell me. You're harassing me, I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna stay after you, I'm sorry. That's just the way I do it. And who can tell you that is Louis. I love this, this young man too, with all my heart. He is now my son, I'm his Harlem mama. That's what he calls me, his Harlem mama. Last year when we did our first conference, he was so impressed with the work that was, that was done that he asked me, well, how can I help? And he was ready to go to work and that's all I needed to hear. So I was blessed enough to put him on our board of trustees. He saw the work we were doing with global sustainability partnerships and he had all these ideas. I'm a firm believer, if young people got it going on, I will step back and let them roll with it. And this came off because of Louie. He has worked the last year diligently working hard. We're excited that he is on our board of trustees. He is the president of the Global Sustainable, uh, Sustainability Partnership. He is also our, our Chief Information Officer for WOCPSCN. So we're just excited, we're honored to have Louie. And Louie, you know I love you, baby. I have to have my Louie fix. It's like, I have to call WhatsApp because I need my Louie fix. If we're not on the phone every day, I'm lost. <laughs> my daughter gets a little jealous because she wants to know well, why you got to talk to him and not to me. But I'll let her slide with that. But anyway, Louie, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you so much, Loretta, and, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm over the moon. Uh, I'm sincerely over the moon with seeing, hearing, listening to all our speakers, um, seeing the global audience, seeing the comments that are coming through, uh, through the chats, the comments of interest, the comments of passion, the comments of support, the comments about their not-nots, um, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing to me. Um, I can't thank, you know, our panel enough. I'm so happy that you're part of WCPSCN as well as being part of the Global Sustainability Partnerships. Uh, it is a monthly convene. So I invite everyone to join us on a monthly basis. So it's every last Wednesday of the month at 10 a.m. Um, EST, New York time. So for people in Britain, you know, it would be 3 p.m. Um, 
my takeaway from from today uh, it's it's been a, a a tremendously powerful conversation my takeaway is you know we're creating a movement we're creating a, a safe space that's needed now more than ever uh, whether it's for um, you know to promote gender equity which is needed uh, we're almost to 2023 it is it is a topic that still needs to be addressed and we are there to address it uh, it is one of our pillars with WOCPSCN. So we highlight it in every single conversation. Um, my other takeaway is, you know, we, we need to work together. Dr. Neil Barsan, again, you know, I'm, I'm really honored that you're here. I can't thank you enough. I'm so happy to, um, you know, to have the opportunity for you to, to be the, the, the first person that receives the, the Legacy Award, uh, because you were really the, the driver that kind of sparked, you know, that idea that kind of motivated us even more to, you know, to, to, to go towards that, that ultimate goal of, you know, come on, we need to work together. Doing nothing is not an option. Doing nothing is not an option. So as you said, climate change already happened you know, health, mental health, those issues are already happening. So what we're doing is, is you know, as Tina said, providing answers. We need more stakeholder, um, you know, multi-stakeholder partnerships, collaborations, cooperations. Um, so so th this is what I hold dear. This is why I thought naming the summit, defining your legacy was important. Because as Dr. Neil Persson said, it's about picking something up for the next generation and to make it better. Um, I'm, I'm in a, well, in, in a good position to feel that. You know, I've, I've lost a parent lately. It's, it's been a, a really difficult time. Um, but having said that, you know, I picked up that fact of, you know, someone that educates you, that provides you with values, that you keep keep strong in your heart, and you need to pick up that faculty and you know educate the world, educate you know the next generation, work with the next gen uh, generation. Um, I think that that's really key as well. We need to work together. We need to listen to youth. Youth is the next generation. Youth is you know they will be living when we will not be there. So. Let's work together to make it, you know, a more sustainable place. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short like that again because uh, I can I can go on for hours about this. But thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, I'm sure we'll we'll connect just after the summit again. Um, Loretta, I know that there was a, a game uh, before the summit just at the very start. So please feel free to announce the winners of the game. On goers, yes, <laughs> thank you so very much. So um, yes, I, as you can tell, I'm a former academic. Yes, I'm a retired professor as well. And I went a little deep with the questions, but that's because I like challenging folks. But two questions that came to mind that people responded to. The first was, um, what was the year and the social media that LinkedIn began? The closest we came to was Jude, uh, who said it was LinkedIn 2018. Close, it was LinkedIn 2019, but he wins anyway. That was close. And the next question was, um, how many countries actually registered for the summit? The closest was Mayanak, and it was 76, but actually there was 150 countries that registered. Every continent on the planet registered for our summit. What I wanna share with you, and especially our uh, guest speakers, your conversations are so needed and so desired that they saw the opportunity to draw from that. Now, I don't take it personal that everyone didn't come. I understand lifestyle situations. It is the middle of the week for some people. But it will be, it'll be posted on, again, our WOCPSCN YouTube page and on our website, WOCPSCN.com. So absolutely, there'll be opportunities for people to engage. Your information is posted. 
We'll make sure it's available for everyone. And let's continue this discourse. There's such synergetic relationships that this conversation must continue and move forward. Thank you. Loretta, Loretta I also want to add from what my understanding, you had over 3,000 registrants. 3,149 registrants, right? I'm so that's a, that's a testament to our guest speakers that when they saw your name, when they saw what you were speaking about, they saw where there was a connection. There was a visceral connection that took place. And I'm grateful and I'm honored to all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I can. I can only 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 confirm. Um, again, my, my many thanks go out to, to all of you. I know that some people have questions. I, I've seen so some raised hands. Uh, so we'll we'll close off with a with a bit of a question and answer. Um, so please feel free if you have a question, um, feel free to raise a hand, um, and um, I'll I'll make sure to redirect to the appropriate speaker. Um, I see that Hisham had a, had a question. Hisham, if you could uh, please share that question with us. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for this uh, chance to raising the question, but it is not a question, but it is answered already. Someone uh, of uh, our colleague, UH, it's, his name is Eddie talking in his uh, chat uh, box about the carbon taxes. And uh, he uh, transferred his experiences and his studies about the carbon taxes in uh, some countries. But all uh, the countries he mentioned uh, is uh, a developed country. And if we are talking about the carbon taxes in the developing country, it will be uh, very difficult According to the economic situation of the uh, now, according to the economic situation now after the crisis, and also before, because of the instability uh, of the economic issue in the developing countries. So uh, here in Egypt, when we start to uh, make any studies for this, uh, the, the the parliament uh, refused or reject this uh, this kind of uh, taxes related to the carbon. Uh, we can say instead of it, we can uh, talk about the carbon market, uh, not carbon taxes, but carbon market. This is uh, first. The, the second, uh, which is uh, more of uh, presentation, is talking about uh, issue related to uh, sustainable development, not only climate change, but sustainable development also. So I have here an initiative. Uh, if anyone interested to working with us in this initiative, uh, it would be welcome to us. This initiative is talking goal zero. Uh, if we are see about the 17 goal, there is no goal uh, for uh, the human rights in uh, in in some uh, in something like uh, sports, in something like. Uh, his mentality for uh, adding something in, uh, in art in, in, in the art. So uh, I, I have a, a, a details of this initiative. If anyone want to work uh, with us with my 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 company in to elaborate this uh, this goal zero initiative, uh, more welcome of course. Uh, and uh, finally, I want to thank Louis and thank. Uh, all of you uh, for this uh, summit, and I hope to participate again in next summit, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hisham. Thank you so so much uh, for for the participation of uh, of um, you know our esteemed uh, one of our esteemed speakers uh, joining us from Egypt. The work you the work that you're involved with and doing uh, that are doing is. Is, is truly groundbreaking, um, hence your involvement with, with COP28. So I want to thank you again uh, so much. Uh, I can see that um, Scan Afric has also raised uh, a hand. So I will go back on, um, on the gallery view. Um, Scan Afric, uh, I, know, I know we've met before in, uh, in, in monthly convenes, 
So please, please feel free to share your question and, and direct it to any of our speakers. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um, it's not a question, actually. It's an observation and a comment. And before I make that observation and comment, I would want to thank all the speakers because everything you have said today is very relevant. But I see a missing point here in everything we do as a race. I am a Sierra Leonean from West Africa living in Norway, and I am now a Norwegian citizen. I've been in this country for close to two decades. I am very happy to be here and I appreciate being in Norway because I believe the world can learn a lot from Scandinavia and especially Norway. The greatest problem we have today is not about policies, it's about our perceptions, our beliefs and approach to mitigating global issues. Climate change, human rights, etc., cetera, children's issues are all related to how we see and understand issues. And these are more or less determined by our collective societal beliefs and perceptions. And if I can say it's about the politics, the ideology. America, as it is today, is having so many problems because it's a society of capitalism where the individual and his ego takes precedence over society. Scandinavian societies are much better off because it's about social and communal contributions to development. In Scandinavia, you have more of social democracy, which some Americans may look at as socialism or communism, where the society cares for the welfare of the person. Most of the problems our children have today come from the fact that there is little parental and community involvement in their upbringing. Yes, there is social media, there is everything all over the place. But if the community, if the parents have more time to care for their children, to observe what they do and to advise how they do what they do, I think it's going to be much better. And I'm sure if we look at data, we'll see that Scandinavian societies have lower problems in terms of children upbringing, crime, etc. cetera. It's because the society has created policies and institutions that allow this to happen. For example, in Norway, when a woman gives birth, she is given one year of full pay maternity leave. The father also has six weeks of full pay maternity leave. We call it uh, Papa's permission. That is, the father has to be with the child, move with the child, take care of the child, etc. Because that emotional connection has to be developed from that level. In the educational system, I'll talk about the educational system because I'm a professional teacher. I was teacher in Sierra Leone for 13 years, and I did five years in Norway as a teacher before I went um, private. In the educational system, there is provision for child-centered policies that will allow the parent and the child to interact at a level wherein issues of emotion, et cetera, et cetera, interactions will be taken care of. 
So if we are looking at a global solution or mitigation of most of these crises, I think if we begin to look at how can we modify society to be more involved? How can we influence the political systems to be more open for participation, liberal? I think that will be a step towards solving the, the global issue, especially with climate change. Yes, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I thank you. Thank you for that input. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for, for that input. And I would love to. I would love to to establish communications with you. We will. We okay. will. We certainly will. I'm a nobody. I live in the Scandinavian culture. We talk about higa, living simple and common. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm so glad that you want to participate. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're talking about what WOCPSEN does. Yes. And the important thing in the American construct, capitalism is a, a structuralist framing that does provide limitations in reference to giving support to family, but it does support family. One of the things mm. we do have the liberty of doing here in the States. America, is America should go social democratic. <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna happen, but that's a whole nother story. You and I can get into that because I'm a post-colonial <laughs> anthropologist. <laughs> okay, we'll do, we'll do Every you. daddy was a guardian. <laughs> you go there, but that's another time. So we want to thank everyone for being with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We want you to have a wonderful day. Thank you all once again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks again to all our speakers, uh, to all our board members that were there as well today. Thank you so much, and um, I hope uh, we will be able to catch up soon in our monthly events. Thank you so much. Take care.